Well, hello, everybody, all my dear friends and brothers and sisters around the world in our Holy Messiah. I hope you enjoy. I hope you get encouragement from today's message. This is Philip Shields with Light on the Rock. Many of you are regulars to the site now and welcome. Remember, I'd love to hear from you. I do get encouragement from the emails and phone calls from many countries around the world. And uh, I don't get that many, but I mean the, I, the ones I get represent many cunt, uh, cu countries. I'm thrilled when I see so many from Russia, from China, Japan, Kenya, and 40 other countries coming to the light of Yehovah's Word, as well as many of you from the U.S. and Canada, of course. Our number one city for visits and hits in the whole world right now, would you believe this, is Moscow. Moscow, Russia. I think that's amazing. Nairobi is number four. Beijing is number five. And uh, I, I just think that's amazing. So um, anyway, thank you for coming and uh, to the website. Really appreciate it. In this Passover to Pentecost season, I thought I'd do something different and talk about five women, five, the number of grace, five women who changed the world. These five are the only women referred to or mentioned in Jesus' genealogy in, in Matthew chapter 1. Forty-one men are mentioned as part of his family tree, starting with Abraham. But if only five are mentioned, five the number of grace, there must be some key reasons why. And so this is going to be a two-part sermon, and I want to go in a little more depth than you might normally have heard um, about some of these women. Of these five women mentioned in the Messiah's family tree, did you realize that three of them are Gentiles? Some of the commentaries I have say four of them are Gentiles. I can only document for sure that three, and, but only, and only two are Israelite. So Gentiles take heart. And not only that, but three of them conceive their baby out of wedlock. Certainly two did. Three, if you count Mary, who wasn't married uh, to the one who was giving the baby. Wow. So right in the genealogy of the very Christ are stories that would make many people blush. I mean, Yeshua's family line, I call him Yeshua, you call him Jesus maybe, I don't know, but Yeshua's his Hebrew name, so I'll say that sometimes. Uh, in Yeshua's family line, the family line is riddled with accounts of incest, fornication, adultery, harlotry, even murder. Let's not sugarcoat it. Why would this be? The answer to that is the reason for this two-part sermon. Each of these five women had a big part in bringing about the very Messiah who would change the world and save the world. And yet at the time... They probably didn't even realize their story would ever be told again, over and over and over again. And here we are thousands of years later telling their story again. But why am I bothering with this? Well, this is the story. This is why I'm bothering with it. This is the story of how Holy Elohim, Most High, our Creator, our Great Holy Father, wants to assure us that He has the power and He has the grace. He has the mercy the wisdom, and the ability to take even very sinful men and women, bring them to repentance, and save them. And not just save them, but take them from the dunghill to the heap of glory. <laughs> you got to admit, I mean, some of what we're going to read today are stories taking people from the dunghill of life, and that includes me. And Paul said that included him. If Paul could admit to it, I guess I can. And I guess you can, certainly, can't you? But the other side of what Paul admitted was on the other side of all of that. When he who makes us holy, he says, he says about that, he says, there, await, there awaits me now a crown of glory. Okay, I have fought the good fight. And so there's that side of it. We don't focus on the dunghill. We focus on 
where we end up at. On a physical level, the sermon and the next one is going to be very earthy, even sordid, even sexual. So if you don't want your kids to hear, it's in the Bible. Everything I say is in the Bible here. We're going to see some of the people in Messiah's lineage, people he allowed to be in his family tree in a new way. Why not more pristine people of the earth who feel peaceful about who they think they are, they're at peace with themselves, and seem unaware of their many other sins, that are, whether it's dishonoring your father, or whether it's murder or rape or whatever it is, uh, we can't feel peaceful about who we are until we are peaceful about who we are in Christ, in Messiah. And that's the only way we can have a peaceful feeling. By showing us the more sordid part of even our Messiah's lineage, we see our Yeshua is born from sinners to save sinners. He shows he's not ashamed of sinners who repent to the point where they're even mentioned in his lineage, sinners who have, said, like I said, incest, murder, intrigue, treachery, rape. You're going to re hear about all of that today. But these same people were the very ones who kept the, many, the Messiah lineage alive. Yes, even Mary, his mother, was a sinner. Scripture says, all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. The only one, that's in Romans 3.23, the only one Scripture says that never, had never sinned was Yeshua himself. So all have sinned, includes Mary, includes all the men and the women in his family tree, and includes all of you, all of us, all of our parents, all of our children, all of our friends, all of us. No one's better than anybody else. So we shouldn't act like we're better than anybody else. It also shows he chooses ordinary men and women to do very extraordinary, earth-shaking things. You are an ordinary man and woman, probably. How can I say that? Because that's what the Bible says God is choosing. In 1 Corinthians 1, 26 to 27, you know, it says, Not many mighty, not many noble, not many wise are called, but God has chosen the insignificance of the world. Most of us don't, wouldn't show up in a book called Who's Who. A book written about us would more likely be called What's That? <laughs> so, Almighty God typically chose shepherds, fishermen, despised tax collectors known for their horrendous lies and thievery, farmers, ordinary women as well, to show his glory of what he could do. I say this again because all of us, if we're really honest with ourselves spiritually, have little to brag about. I certainly often feel like a failure spiritually. I do. I am a failure at times. Praise be to our Father and Savior who is changing you and changing me. Praise be to Yehovah, or some of you say Yahweh. Praise be to Him, those in the coming first resurrection who will shine as the sun in its glory, will be people whom the world takes little notice of now. But no matter your past, no matter your sins, no matter your so-called station in life, you can be a part of the first fruits, covered by the blood of the Lamb, and given a new start. More than that, though, you too are being called to be the very son, the very daughter of the highest royalty of all, a child of Yahweh, a child of Yehovah in the highest. It doesn't get more royal than that. So I don't care if you're one of the so-called untouchables in India hearing this, or just a dressmaker in China, or a fisherman in the Philippines, or, or, or a small businessman in Russia. If you're hearing this... you. Uh, Almighty God is probably calling you to be part of His royal family. So as you hear about or read about these ordinary women who ended up being mentioned in His line, in His lineage, realize He's calling you also, calling you for this unique purpose to be part of His family. It's important to prove who was part of the royal lineage. So we have a long list of begats in the Bible, Book of Chronicles and other places. Some years ago, my wife and I were in Versailles, France, and we took a tour of the palace there, the Palace of Versailles. And one of the things I remember was that when the queen gave birth, there were witnesses to that birth so that that little baby boy being born would be chronicled carefully as royalty. Since royalty depended on being able to establish your heredity, that is what Matthew does here in Matthew 1, verses 1 to 17. Matthew 1, verses 1 to 17. He also establishes Yeshua's divine lineage. 
Matthew basically, you can see his divine lineage in Matthew 1, 18 to 25, that the power of the highest would come upon Mary and that, that what would be born of her would be of God. Matthew basically gives the lineage through the line of Joseph, and Luke gives the lineage uh, through Mary or some other variation on that. But either way, he was of the royal Davidic line. So in understanding Yeshua's Mary, uh, lineage, uh, we will also see how God worked everything out so there would be a Messiah, regardless of the many attempts from Satan the devil to wipe out the possibility of having a Messiah. So I'm going to focus now on five women. Let's focus on five women. Very, very interesting women whose lives are wrapped up in pain. And I've learned that people who never suffer any pain are very shallow people. And it's through the pain that we sometimes see later in life where we grew the most, where some major changes were made in our lives. These five women's lives were wrapped up in pain and shame and sorrow, accusation, sin. And there is some to be accused here. Incest, adultery, murder, lying, treachery, deception. Sometimes, in Mass and Mary's case, she had to take the label of being someone who conceived out of wedlock when she, that wasn't quite the case. So today, let's highlight these phenomenal women. Turn with me to Matthew 1, verses 2 to 4. Matthew 1, verses 2 to 4. And let's begin with a woman named Tamar. Tamar. <clears throat> Matthew 1, verse 2. Abraham begot Isaac. Isaac begot Jacob, or Yaakov. And Yaakov begot Yehuda, Judah, and his brothers. Judah begat Perez and Zerah by Tamar, the first woman mentioned in the lineage of Yeshua. Judah begot Perez and Zerah by Tamar. Perez begot Hezron, Hezron begot Ram, and so on. The first woman mentioned in Yeshua's lineage is a Gentile, Tamar. And I don't know if I'm saying, should it be Tamar or Tamar or Tamar? Anyway, there are several who are named Tamar, Tam, Tamar, or Tamar, I mean, in the scripture. There's Tamar, the daughter of King David and sister of Absalom. That Tamar was raped by her brother or half-brother Amnon, for example. That's not the Tamar we're talking about here. The Tamar we speak of in this genealogy is the daughter-in-law of Judah, the son of Jacob. Tamar means palm or palm tree. And Judah had married a Gentile. Judah had married a Canaanite woman named Shua, who bore three sons. So Judah is mixing the holy seed, as it were. His oldest, Ur, took a wife named Tamar, also Canaanite probably, though the Bible doesn't say for sure. The apocryphal book of Jasser says she was a descendant of Shem, but nobody else says that. Most commentaries that I see say that she was undoubtedly a Canaanite woman and they give their reasons. So Judah and his son were mixing the holy seed and God allowed it. Now that's something to ponder here. You'll see in a lot of these stories that Yehovah allows things to happen that wouldn't be the way he would normally have chosen things to be. But in every case, he works things out to his good timing and his purpose in the end. All things work together for the good. Even, even, even sins that uh, we repent of or sins that God uses still to show that he's more powerful than sin. Excuse me just a second. Anyway, so um, we are the children of God. Children have to be allowed to make mistakes and have to be, have the free will, the free choice. You know how you have to let your child... Uh, uh, you don't always jump up if they're about ready to bang their head underneath the table, you know, when they're toddlers. Uh, you know they have to fall, they have to stumble, they have to bang their head and a uh, little bit. I think they're made of rubber on purpose at that age. Seems that way anyway. <laughs> so uh, Yehovah knows that, and he knew that way back then, and he knows that about you too, that we can also, of our own free choice, choose to think 
Speak and act according to our Heavenly Father's will. Thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Or we can choose not to. It is when we decide to do the things that always please Father. Remember Yeshua saying that in John 8, 29, I always do the things that please Him and please my Father. When we do that, we'll be on solid rock as our foundation. So right off the bat, Judah and his son are doing things not pleasing to the living God. But he'll work it out into his beautiful purpose and time and plan. So in the end, we'll see how great Almighty God is as he uses this Canaanite Gentile woman. So one quick lesson so far is even when, we're, even when we botch things up, if we commit our sins and our ways to Father and repent deeply, confess our sins and repent deeply, he somehow has a way to make things still work out, though they're often painful painful consequences we have to go through as a result of, of the sin. How well I know that. Judah, the father of all Jews, had three sons, Ur, Onan, and Shelah. It's not Sheila like we say, but <laughs> Shelah. Tamar's importance in the genealogy is this. If one of Judah's sons had any sons, then there would have been if, if none, I mean, if none of Judah's sons had no sons or had any sons, then there would have been no tribe of Judah, and therefore the promised Messiah would never have appeared because he was promised to come out of the tribe of Judah. He was the lion of Judah. Judah was going to produce the royalty. So the royal family line would never have started and would have been extinct before it even got going. So we need a male child to come on the scene right after Judah. And so far, there is none. We'll see that one after the other, each of these five women we're going to be talking about was critical in the lineage of Messiah. In this story of deception, Jacob had deceived Isaac by putting on something that felt like a hairy arm. Laban then deceived Jacob by giving him Leah when it was dark and everyone else had had a lot to drink. Jacob's son used the same garment technique to deceive Joseph about, uh, Jacob about Joseph's whereabouts. And now Tamar was going to use a garment to deceive Judah into providing her a rightful son. What goes around comes around. I really believe that the sins that we do we're going to experience the pain we inflicted by our sin. In so many cases, I see that happen, where God just, years later, will make you go through the same thing that you inflicted on other people. How well I know that. Anyway, Judah's firstborn son was Ur. Let's turn now to Genesis 38. And Tamar was given to him as his wife. Genesis 38, verses 6 to 9. But Ur, E-R, Ur was so evil that it says Yahweh or Yehuah killed him. I, 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 the research I've done most recently says the name is Yehuah, so we'll go with that for, for the Almighty God's personal name. Let's read about it. I caution you, Scripture's pretty graphic about some of the sex lives of our forefathers. Anyway, let's read Genesis 38, verse 6. Then Judah took a wife for Ur his son, his firstborn, and her name was Tamar. But Ur, Judah's firstborn, was wicked in the sight of Yehuah, says the Lord in your King James. And Yehuah killed him. Now we're not told why Ur was considered so extraordinary evil, extraordinarily evil that God himself had to be seen as the one killing him. The point I want to make, though, is God does see everything. We can't hide our sins from Him. How well we should know that. <laughs> so Yehuah slew him. Let's continue verse 8. And Judah said to Onan, the second son, now he's already lost one son, so imagine the pain that Judah's going through. I have lost a son in death. 
You can lose sons and daughters in many ways. But I'm talking about I, I lost a son in death. And Judah said to Onan, he's in, in, Judah's in pain, but he knows he has a responsibility. So he says, go in to your brother's wife. And they're pretty explicit. Go in to your brother's wife and marry her and raise up an heir to your brother. But Onan knew that the heir would not be his. And it, and it verse 9, I'm reading Genesis 38, verse 9. And it came to pass when he went into his brother's wife that he emitted on the ground lest he should give an heir an heir to his brother. The thing which he did displeased Yahuwah. Therefore he, Yahuwah, killed him, Onan, also. Now in Bible times there was something later called the Leveret marriage. If a man died and had no sons had given no offspring, no sons, then his brother would take the deceased man's wife, would take his sister-in-law, if you will, and try to produce a son with that wife, that woman. The child of that union would be considered part of the deceased man's lineage. And that child would inherit anything the dead brother might have had. And that child would be actually called the son of that man. That was ideal. That was the way it's supposed to work. Let's read now the one who had died. Let's read now in Deuteronomy 25 verses 5 and 6. If brothers dwell together and one of them dies and has no son, I'm reading from the scripture, Deuteronomy 25, 5 and 6. The widow of the dead man shall not be married to a stranger outside the family. Her father's brother shall go into her, her husband's brother, I mean, her husband's brother shall go into her, take her as his wife, and perform the duty of a husband's brother to her. And it shall be that the firstborn son which she bears will succeed to the name of his dead brother, that his name may not be blotted out of Israel. Presumably other children from that union would be the um, the living brother's uh, children who were doing the duty. You can read verses 7 to 10 of Deuteronomy 25 for more detail in the event that one brother doesn't want to do his duty. But in this case, the second son Onan was willing apparently to have some sex with Tamar, but was not willing to impregnate her and give her a child. Why sire a child and carry all that responsibility just to carry on his dead brother's line, right? That's what he's thinking. And so he selfishly spilled his semen on the ground rather than produce a child. Folks, I'm not saying anything more than what the Bible openly says, okay? Again, why did he do this? Because he was next in line, and if there was no child, Onan would have inherited not only his, perhaps his brother's things, but also Judah's inheritance would have gone to Onan. But now, if he had given us uh, Tamar a son, all of that would have passed on to that boy. So if he'd impregnated Tamar, then that boy would have been called the firstborn as part of Ur, and would have been the inheritor of all that was Judah's as well as Ur's. So Onan was thinking, no, I don't want that. I want to get it all. So he very selfishly spills his seed on the ground, so Tamar could not conceive, or did not conceive. I know some guys who have done that, and they still caused conception. So don't think that that's enough. Usually it was enough in this case. He did this because he realized it wasn't going to be his son anyway. He wanted to be the main inheritor of Judah and did not want a child he was fathering to get what could have been his. Very selfish, but carnally very understandable. <laughs> so this angered God greatly, so Yehoah slew him as well. Now, parents, if children were listening to all of this, you can explain what on earth I was talking about to them later on. <laughs> so have fun. Now, what is the man Judah thinking? The common denominator of my two dead sons, he's thinking. 
is this woman Tamar. She's a sun killer, <laughs> you know. At least, I mean, you would think that. You have three sons. Sheila is just a little, Sheila is just a little boy. And the two old enough to be siring kids are killed by God. When they have intimacy with this woman over here, they come out dead. <laughs> so remember the promised Messiah was supposed to come out of the line of Judah. He had had three sons. Now two are dead. The third one's still a child. Judah is understandably concerned about losing his last son, Shelah, to this woman who seemed to be involved in the death of each of his sons. And Shelah was apparently too young. So let's pick up the story in Genesis 38, verse 11. Then Judah said to Tamar, his daughter-in-law, Remain a widow, and you're, he just kind of kicks her out. Says, uh, go back home, <laughs> you know, dress in your black garments for the rest of your life. And, well, anyway, remain a widow in your father's house until, until my son Shelah is grown. For he said, lest he also die like his brothers. So he's already thinking, I don't really want to give Shelah to him, to her. And Tamar went and dwelt in her father's house. So she goes back home. And back then, it was a very shameful thing to be right or wrong, the way it was, for women to go childless. It was very embarrassing, very humiliating. Your whole desire in life and, uh, at that time was to have children. If you're a woman, that was your goal, that was your duty, that was your job. So Judah sends her packing back to her father's house. Terrible shame to be a widow, especially if you were a childless widow. So Judah's plan was fine, dandy. But then Judah never honored his word. Tamar got older and older, and Shayla was never given to her as a husband. But Tamar wanted to have a child. He wanted, she wanted a family. And she wanted to perhaps even continue. The, maybe she understood the importance of the lineage. But without her, there would have been no tribe of Judah, at least so far. Please get that. Without Tamar, there would be no tribe of Judah as we know it today. All you Jews hearing this, you wouldn't exist if it weren't for Tamar. Did you know that? Yeshua would have no tribe to come to if it weren't for Tamar so far. Genesis 38. So far, there's no, no, no sons anyway. Genesis 38, verses 12. And let's read all the way to 30. We'll break it up once in a while. Verse 12. Now, in the process of time, the daughter of Shua, Judah's wife, died. So now Judah's wife dies. Judah was comforted, went up to his sheep herders in Timnah. He and his friend Hiram or Hira, the Adulamite. And it was told Tamar, saying, Look, your father-in-law is going to Timnah to shear his sheep. Now, that was a great celebratory time for the man, and they'd have a good time and all that. But one source I have says that if the dead husband's brothers weren't up for the job, then the father of those boys was to do the job of producing a child. That's not in Scripture. But one source I have says that it was at that time and that custom and that uh, part of the world understood if the if the kids can't do it then dad's got to do it i mean i can't think of something more abhorrent to most women than to have to have sex with their father-in-law at least that's what tamar is thinking but she's not thinking in terms of incest but in terms of producing a child for this very important family line to continue and to keep her from being childless which was a shame so we go to verse 14 genesis 38 now she took off her widow's garments, covered herself with a veil, and wrapped herself, and sat in an open place which was on the way to Timnah, for she saw that Shelah was grown, and she was not given to him as a wife. When Judah saw her, okay, his wife's been dead a while, and he has, he's feeling some need or whatever. <laughs> so when Judah saw her, he thought she was a harlot because she had covered her face. And then he turned to her by the way and said, Please let me come in to you. That's kind of blunt. For he did not know that she was his own daughter-in-law. 
So she said, what will you give me that you may come in to me? What, how much are you going to pay me for it? Now this Judah had no money, but he wanted sex with this woman, so he thought, the, whom he thought, whom he thought was a prostitute, and he was quite willing to have sex with someone he thought was a prostitute. I want you to remember that. And he's, and there are many, many, many men who have had sex with prostitutes. Many, many military men certainly have. Many, many people, uh, anyway, it's, it's, it's done a lot in society. And he said, I will send a young goat from the flock. She said, will you give me a pledge until you send it? I'm not, I'm not stupid. I want to have a deposit. I want to have something here. And he said, what pledge will I give you? So she said, your signet and cord and your staff that's in your hand. And then he gave them to her and he went in to her and she conceived by him. Well, the signet was a very, very special kind of a ring or a, not really a ring as, as such, but almost like one's ID. It was tied to a cord that was then hung around one's neck. It was not worn as a ring, like a lot of people would think. No, no. It was almost more like a soldier's ID tags, dog tags, you know, uh, in, the, in the U.S. military. It would be equivalent to us today saying, um, here, uh, leave me your driver's license and your, and your keys or something, you know. As, as, and, then, and then when you give me that goat, I'll give you your li driver's license and your keys back. Well, back then it was a signet ring or signet of some kind, not necessarily a ring, tied to a cord that he wore around your neck. It was your ID tag. One commentary I read said, based on the Hebrew words used in the text, that she was dressed up like a temple prostitute to Astarte or Easter and what we now call by the name Easter. I kid you not. Now look it up. So she was not dressed just as an ordinary woman or prostitute, but as a temple prostitute. Easter, called different names in different areas, Astarte, Easter, and so on, was the goddess of fertility and sex. Anyway, Tamar is dressed as a prostitute, and Judah, who is now a widower, feels the need and goes into her, as the Bible puts it. Now we're back to Genesis 38, verse 19. I'm not condoning anything Judah's doing here, folks. Okay. Verse 19. So she arose and went away, laid aside her veil, put on the garments of her widowhood. Judah sent the young goat. And the story continues in verse 20 to uh, 23 that he tried to pay it. They couldn't find her. No one, the people say, hey, there's no prostitutes been around here. So Judah goes away and says, well, I tried. So Judah's trying to at least pay the cost of what he thought was the price of a whore and to get his signet ring, staff, and cord back, but she was nowhere to be found. He's probably a little concerned. Where's my driver's license right now, you know? <laughs> this was his ID card, if I, if I can liken it to something we have today. Verse 30, verse 24, Genesis 38, 24. It came to pass about three months later that Judah was told, saying, You know what? Tamar, your daughter, is pregnant. In fact, she's been playing the whore, the harlot. And now she's, in, now she's pregnant by that harlotry. So part of it was true. It's not that she kept on doing it over and over again, but this is the story that's getting out there. And Judah said, Bring her out and let her be burned. Judah, like so many men through time, was a hypocrite. He was the one who had gotten her pregnant. He was the one who had had sex with someone he thought was a harlot. But because men don't have to carry the evidence, the pregnancy, many men get away with it. We men need to repent of our double standard in the past. I said our. Let's make it in the past. In so many societies, the sex sin is okay as long as it can be covered up as an abortion, which is another sin, or a shotgun wedding. And nowadays, people just openly live in sin and call that person their significant other. We don't, we don't even refer to the words fornication or premarital sex anymore. 
Uh, when's the last time you've talked about or heard of the, the term premarital sex? No, people just live together, and they're significant others, and people are openly doing so, and there's no shame whatsoever because no one's talking against fornication. Fornication, living together with someone you're not married with, having sex with someone you're not married with, is a sin and will keep you out of the kingdom of God unless it's repented of. So Judah had sex out of marriage, doesn't know it was his own daughter-in-law, and now wants her burned at the stake or burned to death. Typical male justice through the years. I hope you hear that as my sarcasm. Verse 25. And when she, brought, when she was brought out, she sent to her father-in-law, saying, By the man to whom these belong, I am with child. And she said, Please, determine whose these are. The signet, the cord, the staff. Whose is this? Whose are these? Well, surely many people would have recognized those articles as belonging to Judah. So he knew he was caught. We're still reading about it today. But on the other hand, when we've done something wicked that we've repented of, though God puts away our sins far away and buries it, people don't. But perhaps we can take some strange comfort knowing that the intimate details of some sins like Judah's, like David's, like Samson's, and many others, are still being told today, thousands of years later. And we have to learn to accept that there are awful consequences to our sins. But we won't be the first that's having the equivalent of the National Enquirer screaming out your sins or gossip of your alleged sins to everybody else. So Judah acknowledged, verse 26, So Judah acknowledged them and said, She's been more righteous than I, because I did not give her to Shelah, my son. And he never knew her again. Nice guy. Judah at least was honest. He was caught, in, he was caught though. I mean, I don't, he was forced to be honest. He, and he was good enough to admit it, that he was the one who was the sinner. He was the one who was at fault. It was his sin. His sin was not just confined to having lust-filled sex with what he thought was a temple prostitute. No, it was that Judah had lied and broken his word, his covenant, that he, he had not kept his promise that he would let Sh Sheila be the husband for Tamar when he grew up. But this sin on his part, by the sin on his part, he had helped push Tamar into her own actions to somehow in desperation produce a child and have an inheritance in the tribe of Judah, and start the messianic royal line. Judah was being quite harsh, but in the end, Tamar was more or less in vindicated. Folks, the sin here is more Judah's than it was Tamar's, by a long shot, by a long shot. I'm not justifying what Tamar did, dressing up like a whore, and, and then seducing her, her father-in-law, although it didn't sound like she was doing a whole lot, just sitting there in the square. <laughs> Uh, but in so many cultures, if the woman is, uh, is in the least bit improper or is walking around uh, without an escort, she is condemned, burned, hanged, killed, honor killings, and so on. But men can seemingly do whatever they want and go to strip bars, play on the Internet, call an escort service, or have flirtations or worse at work, and seemingly get away with it. But folks, sin is sin. Men, a big lesson here. He got caught. Your sins will find you out. Yeah, we should all know that. We're still reading about his shameful action, the hypocrisy that he had. That's commonly done. For example, Henry VIII notoriously beheaded Queen Anne, his wife, for alleged improprieties, but it was well known that King Henry VIII himself was consistently, constantly, having dalliances with other women. But it was wrong for Anne to do it, but not for him somehow. No way. Sin is sin. There should be one law. Anyway, it came to pass, remember she's pregnant now, by Judah. I can't think of something worse than if your father-in-law be the one. But anyway, it came to pass at the time for giving birth that, behold, twins were in her womb. And as is so often the case, you know, was it uh, Rebecca had twins, right? Jacob and Esau. 
And it was like two nations fighting it out. It was kind of going on here, too. And so it was when she was giving birth that one put out his hand. It's supposed to be the head come out first, right? Well, the hand comes out. And the woman, or the midwife, took a scarlet thread and bound it on his hand, saying, This one came out first. And then it happened as he drew back his hand that his brother came out unexpectedly, and she said, How did you do that? How did you break through? This breach is upon you. So they called him Perez, meaning breach or breakthrough or something like that. Anyway, afterwards his brother came out and with a scarlet thread on his hand, and his name was called Zerah. Well, Perez, the one who came out first, uh, fully born first, Perez becomes the ancestor of King David and eventually the Christ. Now, I want you to think about it. This is the precursor to the union of Israel and Gentile. Judah was an Israelite and the father of all Jews. Judah became a great tribe in the nation of Israel. It, it, it wasn't all of Israel. It was just one tribe. But Judah's next in line for the Messianic lineage was from his incestuous sex with his own Gentile stepdaughter. I want you to get that. But my point is, Israelite and Gentile producing a child. The Bible doesn't edit it out. The Bible doesn't make it seem rosier than it seems than you might want it to be. Just the way it is. And God in his grace and mercy, though not condoning the incest and the deception, was able to use even that sordid story to fulfill his goal of having the messianic line get started and not be broken. And so here we have Perez, the line from which Messiah would come, who was one half Israelite and one half Gentile, because he came from his father Judah, and his mother, Tamar, who was a Canaanite. Now think about it. I think it carries a very strong message. <clears throat> it's a message to us all. When we repent of our sins and move on in his grace, Yehovah our God is able to use even former sinners to his glory. Yep, even you. Even me. Yep, even Tamar. Even Judah. I can't imagine what it would be like having intimacy with your father-in-law. I just can't. That would be horrible. So I'm not accusing, excusing her either, though. But she waited and waited and waited and finally took matters into her own hands. And yes, she got pregnant. And the lineage of Christ after Judah was now on its way. We'll see more Gentiles, the family line, shortly. But without Tamar, the royal line of Messiah, the line of Judah, would never have even gotten started. That's her importance to the story, that she's the one who started the royal line of Judah, the descendants of Judah, okay? <clears throat> Next up, in the lineage of Christ, this time another Gentile, this time a real prostitute, Rahab. Okay, let's go into another juicy story here. Matthew 1, verses 3 to 6. Matthew 1, verses 3 to 6. I already read about Judah begetting Perez and Zerah by Tamar. And Perez begot Hezron, Hezron begot Ram, Ram begot Aminadab, Aminadab begot Nashon, Nashon begot Salmon. Salmon begot Boaz by Rahab. Rahab, Rahab, whatever. And Boaz begot Obed by Ruth. And Obed begot Jesse, Jesse begot David the king. Who's Salmon or Salmon or Salmon? And who's this Rahab? <clears throat> As you read the Bible, there's so many people who are mentioned by their occupation. Nehemiah the cupbearer, Herod the king, David the shepherd, Joseph the carpenter, Lydia the seller of purple, Isaiah the prophet, Amos the sheep breeder and tender of sycamore trees. And then there's Rahab the... <laughs> Rahab the... Rahab, the, do, we, do we have to say it? Yeah, the harlot. And to make matters worse, we might normally think this harlot, we might normally think it's making matters worse, it's finding her way somehow into the very lineage of our Messiah. Why would Yehovah allow such a thing? The answer tells us so much more about Yehovah, God Most High. Just think, streetwalker, whore, harlot, 
prostitute, woman of the night. Some of you don't even want me saying these words. It's in the Bible. The harlot, okay? Whatever you want to call her, that's what she was. Uh, I'll talk later about some of those people who want to call her the innkeeper or something else, but you can't get around the words used in the Hebrew and the Greek. Porne, she was Rahab the Porne. I guess where porne leads you to, pornography and all that, you know, I mean, the, the same root word. Somehow she's in the family tree, from the dunghill to glory. <laughs> okay, let's face it, that's all of our stories. Paul said his past was just so much dung in Philippians 3. Garbage, dung, he says in King James, I think. But do the rest of us realize that that's all of our story, that story of all of us? I think that could be a big reason why Rahab is in here. No need to whitewash her past. No need to pretend she was something she wasn't. This is actually part of the very message, even a whore. If she repents of her sin and accepts the true living God, can be accepted in the camp of Israel. Even a whore. In her case, even in the very part of the family tree of the eternal God. I just want to, I just want to understand, I just want you to understand what we're talking about here. Okay, so. This is actually part of the message that even a whore, if she repents, can be accepted. Some like to teach that this Rahab was just an ordinary Israelite and not Rahab the harlot. And yet, every other woman in the family tree is already previously mentioned in Scripture. The only Rahab who is mentioned in Scripture at about the time of Salmon would be the woman referred to as Rahab the harlot. So I'm confident this is the Rahab mentioned in the book of Joshua. I've read many researches and documentaries and, and uh, documents, I mean, uh, trying to convince the reader that, no, 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 this is not the harlot. But Rahab the harlot makes, Hebrew, makes also the Hebrews 11 Hall of Fame of Faith, <coughs> which also makes me wonder or makes me think that this probably is Rahab the harlot. The ground is a level playing field, folks, at the cross of Messiah. All humans need the blood of the cross. So she's put right there next to giants in the book of Hebrews 11, the giants of faith, like Abel, Enoch, Noah, Abraham, Moses. She is only one of two women mentioned in the whole chapter 11. Only two. The other one's Sarah, the wife of Abraham. And then the second one is this dark black or dark Gentile harlot, named Rahab. She was a Canaanite. Remember, Canaan was from Ham, the black race. And God loves black people as much as brown or white people. He made us all, and he made Rahab. And he brought Rahab into his very family. Now, there's some discussion whether or not she was an innkeeper. Uh, the Hebrew word here is zona. The Greek translation of the Old Testament calls her a harlot, using the word porne. Hebrews 11.31 calls her in the Greek the porne, Rahab, clearly meaning harlot. God's very open about the sins and the past of his heroes. I suggest you read chapters 2 to 6 of Joshua to get the whole story, which I won't have time to read today fully, but I would also say it's possible that she could have also been an innkeeper as well as a harlot, that would be really convenient to a way to get customers and be sure to have them coming back again and again. <laughs> you know, she's, she wants them to come again and again. So uh, <laughs> so why not be a harlot and, uh, and an innkeeper at the same time? In Hebrews 11, verses 30 to 31, By faith the walls of Jericho fell down after they were encircled for seven days. Hebrews 11. By faith the harlot... The porne, Rahab, did not perish with those who did not believe when she received the spies with peace. Two women mentioned in Hebrews 11 in the hall of faith, in the hall, of, in the, in, you know, in the 
Hall of Fame of Faith. Um, and Rahab is one of only two. Of all the places the spies could have stayed, <laughs> how they ended up with a harlot is beyond me. But that's the way it was. It is what it is, okay? Apparently, I'm not implying anything. I'm just saying apparently, Yehovah wanted to save this woman who believed in him and apparently wanted a new life, a changed life, as we all do. And so right off the bat, the Bible doesn't hesitate to tell us that even a Gentile harlot was the one uh, to where these two spies ended up going. You know, it's strange to me somehow, but it's the way it is. Uh, they, But the grace of God can be extended to anybody, and that person can be included in the lineage of the Messiah. Now, some of you hearing this may have either used harlots or been harlots. Some of you are about ready to turn this off because you don't like talking about this in a spiritual sense. Well, you better start cutting out some things out of your Bible then because the Bible's pretty full of some of these stories. I hope you keep reading and because there's some interesting and inspiring messages in here as well. So yes, even you, even I, can be forgiven and given a fresh start. Whether people give you that or not, well, that's up to them. They'll face their judgment and God won't hear their prayers if they don't forgive others or reconcile with others. The grace of God, the blood of the Lamb of God, covers all our sins. This Gentile whore who had to come to confess the God of Israel, believe in him. Yehuah honors that. So what happens is the, the Israelites have crossed the, the, the Jordan and um, spies from other nations are watching these Israelites crossing over. And I'm sure traitors, tra uh, traders, not traitors, but traders, uh, would run into this group of people and, and, and tell their stories as they went around the world and uh, around the known world back then. And uh, you can hear how, anyway, Joshua wants to find if there's a weakness in that city, that fortified city, he wants to get rid of it. So he sends a couple spies to go in there and try to find uh, a weak spot in the defenses, in the walls or whatever. And when it's reported that there's two Israelite spies and that, and that they're at Rahab's, the men of the city, the king, everybody, all seem to know where she was and who she was, and they come looking for the spies there. And in Joshua 2, verses 8 to 14, Joshua 2, verses 8 to 14, Now before they lay down, she came up to them on the roof and said to them, I know that Yehovah, that's the Lord, had given you the land, that the terror of you has fallen on us, and that all the inhabitants of the land are faint-hearted because of you. For we have heard about you, how Yehovah dried up the water of the Red Sea for you when you came out of Egypt, and what you did to the two kings of the Amorites, who were on the other side of the Jordan, Sihon and Og, whom you utterly destroyed. They were powerful men. And now comes her confession of the true Elohim. I recommend you read the story, Joshua 2 to 6 or so, at least Joshua 2, 3, and 4, uh, to get the whole story. <clears throat> now, her confession of the Messiah, of the, of the, of, of the God of Israel, I mean, <clears throat> it's not as well known as Ruth, but here it comes. And so she's continuing what she's saying to the two spies, whom she's trying to hide here. <clears throat> and as soon as we heard these things, our heart melted. Neither did there remain any more courage in anyone because of you. For Yehovah your Elohim, for the Lord your God, for Yehovah your Elohim, He is Elohim, meaning God. He is Elohim in heaven above and on earth beneath. That's her confession. Now therefore I beg, swear to me by Yehovah, since I have shown you kindness, that you will also show me kindness to my father's house, and give me a true token, and spare my father, my mother, my brothers, my sisters, and all that they have, and deliver our lives from death. Now here's a woman who's probably looked down on by everybody. Maybe by even her own family. So many times when someone does something horrible in a family, the more righteous ones look down on that person, whether that be your brother, your sister, your father, whoever it is. And yet, no matter how she was treated, she is beseeching the protection, the, the safety of her 
family members. She's thinking of others, not just herself. So the men answered her, Our lives for yours, for if none of you tell this business of ours, and it shall be, when Jehovah has given us the land, that we will deal kindly and truly with you. One of those two spies, the Jewish lore says, one of those two spies was Salmon, who married Rahab. Okay? <clears throat> Again, you can't prove that. But that is that is uh, the, the story that's being told and has been told for a couple thousand years or more. In Joshua 2, verses 17 to 21, So the men said to her, We will be blameless of this oath of yours, which you've made us swear, unless when we come in the land you bind this line of scarlet cord in the window. She apparently had a house right on the wall. And they had a window there through which you let us down, that window. And unless you bring your father, your mother, your brothers, and all your father's household to your own home. And, and, and in other words, this part of the house will be protected, this part of the wall, this part of the city. And so it shall be that whoever goes outside the doors of your house into the street, his blood shall be on his own head, and we will be guiltless. And whoever is with you in the house, his blood shall be on our head, if a hand is laid on him. And if you tell this business of ours, then we will be free from this oath which you have made us swear. And so they have a covenant going on, and that she said, According to your words, so be it. And so she sent them away, and they departed, and she bound the scarlet cord in the window. She lets them down the, the wall by a rope, a scarlet rope. She would be identified by the scarlet rope. Passover was coming up. Here was a woman who not only dealt in harlotry, perhaps in innkeeping, but also apparently she covered the men up in the flax that was drying on the roof. And out of flax you make linen. And then she had scarlet. So she probably had scarlet linen and so forth. Scarlet, red, the color of Yeshua's blood. This was Passover season. Passover was, wasn't even there yet. I think there could be a tie-in. In Isaiah 1, verse 18, Yehovah says to us, Though your sins be as scarlet, they shall be white as snow. In faith, she confessed the living God. In faith, her deeds matched her words, because true faith has actions that match what we say. Too many of us, including most of us at one time or another, we've had to repent of it, have said things that sound holy, and then, I've, then, our, then we've had actions that didn't match the words. I preach to myself. All of that has to stop. In James 2, verses 24 to 25, James 2, verses 24 to 25, James says, talking about faith, he says, you see then that a man is justified by works and not by faith alone. Likewise, wasn't Rahab the harlot, Rahab the porny again, also justified by works when she received the messengers and sent them out another way? All this happened before Passover. Then they circled the city of Jericho for seven days and presumably... Some think it was the last day of unleavened bread. Some think it was a month later. I believe the Jewish teaching is that it's a month later. However it was, when the walls fell, it seems like the house of Rahab stood standing, perhaps, or somehow they were protected, except where Rahab and their family were, everything else was destroyed. Something's very interesting. They lived on the wall, and they had the red cord tied to the window, red, the color of the Christ's blood. You can read in Joshua 6, verses 22 to 25, how that all end, ends up here. Joshua 6, verses 22 to 25. Joshua had said to the two men who had spied out the country, the two young men, Go into the harlot's house, and from there bring out the woman and all that she has, as you swore to her. 
And the young men who had been spies went in. The young men who had been spies went in and brought out Rahab, her father, her mother, her brothers, and all that she had. And so they brought out all her relatives and left them outside the camp of Israel, at least for a time. But they burned the city and all that was in it with fire, only the silver and the gold and the vessels of bronze and irons they put in the treasury of the house of the Lord. And Joshua spared Rahab, the harlot, her father's household, and all that she had. So she dwells in Israel to this day, at the time this was being written, because she hid the messengers whom Joshua sent to spy out Jericho. Now, Israelite men were not supposed to marry any of the Canaanites. But from what I can see, if Gentiles converted to and worshipped the true God of Israel, the true God, the true living God, they were apparently allowed into the congregation. Don't forget there was an entire mixed multitude that came out of Egypt with Israel. Bathsheba married Uriah, who was also a Canaanite. Hittites were among the nations of Canaan. Heth, you know, they come from Heth, one of the descendants of Canaan. Uriah was a believer in the living God. He was a Hittite. So was Boaz, who married Ruth, a Moabites, who confessed her belief in the God of Israel as well. Your God shall be my God, okay? Your people, my people. And so I think after her show of faith to the living God, this Rahab, that she was allowed to marry Salmon and become an ancestor of Messiah's family tree, or in it. God is not against racial issues so much as he's against believers being unequally yoked to unbelievers. That's the issue. It's not race. It's a matter of who your God is. That's what matters most to our Father in heaven. Even Moses married an Ethiopian, a black woman. And uh, Salmon married a black woman. And uh, Boaz married Ruth, a Moabitess. Uh, Bathsheba married a dark man, Uriah, the, of, of Heth. I need to say all this because some teachers teach that Rahab and Ruth converted to Judaism. And I totally disagree, brethren. Judaism, as practiced today, is not the religion of the Old Testament. And I'll speak on that in the next few weeks. Judaism gives us a lot of, uh, gives us about as much credence to the Babylonian Talmud as they do the Holy Scriptures, maybe even more so. They study the Talmud more than Scripture. Uh, and when they do study Scripture, they put 90% of their focus, or so it seems, on, on the Torah, the first five books, hardly ever read the rest of it. So we are to live by every word of God, Yeshua said. And remember, Yeshua was constantly at odds with the Pharisees, who were the ancestors of modern Orthodox Judaism. So that should tell you something. Constantly at odds with them. And I'll, I'll talk about Judaism and the religion of the Bible and all that in the coming sermon. And may Rahab and later on Ruth converted to the religion of the Bible, which is based on having a worshipful relationship with the one true living God, Yehovah in the highest. Rahab's story in a nutshell, shame to glory. Whatever your past, commit your life to Yeshua. Ask him to cleanse you, to give you a new heart. Ask him to make you new. And whether people believe you're different or not doesn't matter. What matters is what God thinks. I'm sure there were whispers for years about there goes Rahab the harlot. But this I know. When you and I meet her in the resurrection, we're not going to be going up to her saying, Oh, I, I know about you. I read all about you in God's word. Uh, you're, you're that whore. You're, you're that harlot, that streetwalker, Rahab the harlot. No, you're not, brethren. No, you're not going to say that. You're going to be honored to meet a woman who was a pillar of faith who thought about her family, too, and saved many people alive, who realized it was time to acknowledge the true living God, who realized that what she was doing would have been seen as treason by anybody else in the city of Canaan, the nation of Canaan, the city nation, city state, and she, would have, she could have died very easily for that. You'll be honored to meet such a woman who confessed the true living God and used the scarlet cord the scarlet thing that ties us together, the blood of Yeshua. And she tied it through her window to identify that here lives Rahab the harlot who believes in the living God of Israel and wants to worship that God from now on and walk in his ways 
I'm sure she did not continue to be a harlot. She became a good wife, and you'll be honored to meet Rahab, the wife of Salmon. Rahab, the child of God. Rahab, the woman of in tremendous, of incredible faith. Because it's how we end up that counts. I wrote a blog on that. We must accept the grace of God over all of our sins and let Yeshua live in us once more. Rahab undoubtedly put away her sin of harlotry and became an outstanding citizen in Israel. Okay, I wouldn't go up to her in the in the resurrection and say, Oh, you're Rahab the whore. No, 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 don't do that. The lesson of Rahab we can read about in the New Testament. In Ephesians 2, Ephesians 2, verses 1 to 10, I just want to read through it. You he made alive. This is Rahab and us we're talking about. This is all of us. Who were dead in trespasses and sin, in which you once walked according to the course of this world. We once did things like the world does, but we're supposed to be coming different. Becoming different. According to the prince of the power of the air, according to Satan, was the way we used to live. The spirit who now works with the sons of in, in the sons of disobedience, among whom we all once conducted ourselves in the lusts of our flesh. You see how Paul writes, we all did this. Come on, don't, don't think you're better than anybody else. Fulfilling the desires of the flesh. But we like to think that, oh, your sins are horrible. You had a horrid past. You're a criminal. You're a sinner. And somehow we, ours aren't as bad or yours aren't as bad. He's, Paul says, we all fulfill the desires of the flesh and of the mind. And we're by nature children of wrath, just as the others. We were by nature children of wrath. When we're born, we have that human nature carnal nature that does not want to submit to God's law, hates God's law, hates God. But God, who is rich in mercy, because of his great love which he loved us, even when we were dead in trespasses, made us alive together with Christ. I'm reading Ephesians 2, verse 5. By grace you have been saved, and raised us up together, and made us sit together in the heavenly places in Christ Jesus. <clears throat> raised us up together. This condemning, snotty attitude that so many have of thinking they're better than someone else or that they can't hang around someone else, they can't trust someone else who is in Christ. We're supposed to have all been raised up together and made us sit together in the heavenly places in Christ Jesus that in ages to come he might show the exceeding riches of His grace in His kindness towards us, towards all of us in Christ Jesus. So we can't go to Rahab and think that, oh, you know, I'm sorry, once a harlot, always a harlot. And I can't have my husband around you unless I'm in the same room with you or something. You know, come on, guys. Of course, that wouldn't happen anyway, I'm sure. So uh, that example, you, yeah, you don't normally go alone in, with women. But anyway, for by grace you have been saved through faith, and that not of yourselves, it is the gift of God, not of works, lest anyone should boast. Not of works, lest anyone should boast. Our salvation is not of works, for we are his workmanship. He's the one doing that work in us, created in Christ Jesus for good works which God prepared beforehand that we should walk in them. So he's the one who now lives in us, and he is now the one working righteousness in us. He is the one now, we're, we're, just, we're just branches on the vine, and the, the vine is the one putting the juices out to the branches, producing the fruit. And there are other scriptures, I, I like the one in 2 Corinthians verses 5, um, chapter 5, verses 16 to 19, where it says when, when we're in Christ, we should no longer think of that person the way they were before they had repented and before they, they uh, have Christ working in their lives. So anyway, I don't believe Rahab's going to have a sign in front of her new house warning in the resurrection that here lives a whore, beware. <laughs> I'm sure they didn't pin a scarlet A for adulteress on her blouse or robe or a P for porne or a Z for zona in the Hebrew. 
But we seem to like to keep a record of wrongs. We seem to like to spread those record of wrongs around. That's not of God. That's of Satan, the devil. The devil means slanderer. God's children don't go around looking for dirt. Certainly don't ask for it and don't repeat dirt that they've been that you know has been repented of. You be better than that. You be better than that. Let's not follow that pattern of the world, the National Enquirer attitude. Let's be better than that. And let's let people have a new start, and let's let each other have a new start. I think any of you have had a past, as I've had, and Frank, we've all have had, have had, can take solace and encouragement from Rahab the harlot. And any of you who are Gentiles, you should be rejoicing that there's a number of Gentiles in the lineage of Messiah, probably Tamar, and now Rahab. And there will still be more. The next one is also a Gentile. I don't have the time to do the next one justice, but I'm going to tell you that I'm going to have a full-length sermon about this next one, Ruth. The next woman mentioned, let's just go through as much as we can, 10 minutes, but I'll... I'll give a whole sermon entirely on lessons from the book of Ruth and the barley season and the Feast of Pentecost and all of that. The next woman mentioned among the five women here is a Gentile, Ruth, Moabite. Her name means companion or friend. I plan a whole sermon, like I said. Anyway, she's known as the great humble Moabitess who marries Boaz. It's almost like Yehovah is inspiring the inclusion of three Gentile women in the lineage just to make a big point, the Gentiles are not excluded. Please, all of you in Asia, Africa, South America, anyone not, a Gen not an Israelite, listen to the two sermons I gave entitled Encouragement for Gentiles, which I gave in 2012. What you may not have known is that Jewish, this is important, that Jewish and several extra-biblical sources say that Ruth was a Moabite princess. She was the granddaughter of the Moabite king Eglon, who occupied Israel for 18 years until a judge named Ehud killed him. That's in, The story is told in Judges, Judges chapter 3. Eglon himself was the grandson of the infamous Balak, or Balak, king of Moab in Moses' time. Remember, Balak was the one who enticed Balaam, the false prophet, the false priest, to try to curse Israel. You can read that story in Numbers 22 to 24. So, Ruth is the granddaughter of Eglon. Eglon is the grandson of Balak. Okay? So she's the great, great, great granddaughter of Balak. So Yehuwah is so merciful that he even chooses a descendant in his lineage to be one of the despised descendants, a despised descendant of one of the Moabite kings, Balak and Eglon, to be part of his lineage. I want you to hear that and get that. That also means that King David himself was part Gentile, part Moabite, and that's getting ahead of the story, but I can't resist. It means Yeshua himself as a man had some Gentile blood in him as well from Mary. Because they're Gentiles in this lineage. So even Yeshua had Gentile blood in him. Hallelujah! I hope you all understand the significance of what I'm saying here, you Gentiles. Moab was one of the sons from Leah, I'm sorry, from Lot, was one of the sons from Lot having intercourse with his daughters after Sodom was destroyed. The daughters thought the whole world had been blotted out. They thought they were the only ones left alive. They thought the future mankind rested on them. At least that's my read of it. So the daughters said, hey, there's no other man around. It's just dad and us. And it's now on our shoulders to repopulate the whole world. Because from what they could see out there, God had blotted out everything. Blotted out everything by fire, except the story of Ruth. 
Anyway, so they give birth to Moab and Ammon, who become thorns in Israel's side except for the story of Ruth. The Moabitess. It must have been like one of those times when there was relative peace between Israel and Moab when they went back and forth between the two nations. But I really want to give a full-length sermon on it so much <clears throat> because there's so much in this book. In the book, Elimelech, his name is very important. I'll talk about that. And his sons all die in Moab, leaving widows. And after the famine, Ruth converts to the God of Israel. Your God shall be my God, okay? And Ruth and Naomi return, where? Where to Bethlehem, which means house of bread, where the future bread from heaven was going to be born, Yeshua. This was all during the barley harvest, so that's why I'm going to focus on it in a later sermon. So Ruth, throughout the story, is this humble, selfless daughter-in-law, a princess, but a humble one, caring for her aging mother-in-law. <sighs> How blessed we are to have children and in-laws when they care about you. It's a wonderful story. Anyway, just like the story of Tamar, the Leverett marriage law came to play in this story as well. Boaz, a leader in Judah, a prince of Judah, and much, much, much older than Ruth, took his responsibility and marries Ruth. And out of that union come their son Obed, who begot Jesse, who begot David, the king of Israel, and eventually the Messiah. The point of all of that story really is, now again, I'll say much, much more about Ruth in a whole sermon dedicated just to her story. Yehovah loves all people of the world. As John 3.16 said, God so loved the world, not just the Jews, not just the Israelites. God so loved the world that he gave his only son. For the whole world, not just Jews. Galatians 3 says, Galatians 3.26-29, that anyone who is in Christ... He says, and if you are Christ, you are Abraham's seed and heirs according to the promise. In Galatians 3, 26 to 29, he says, there's no more Greek, no more Jew, no more Greek, no more Gentile, okay? No more slave, no more male, no more female. You're all one in Christ. That's the point of this story. The one body when God will bring together all the Gentiles and all the Israelites and bring them together into one. And Ruth was a huge, huge part of that story. And Yehovah wants you in his family too. He wants to be your father too. He wants you to be his child as much as any Israelite or any Jew. And frankly, I'm watching with great interest the explosion of, of interest out of China, out of Japan and Russia and Kenya and Russia. You know, it's just amazing to me. Anyway, we'll give a whole sermon about Ruth. And uh, Ruth being mentioned in the lineage is, is this Messiah's exciting way of telling all you Gentiles, yes, you too can be part of my family. I'm not ashamed of Gentiles. I'm not ashamed of Moabites or Gentiles. And if you do what Ruth did and accept the one true God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, you can also be part of my family as well, he's saying. You do what Ruth did. Do what Tamar did or at least we, we think she did, and do what Rahab clearly did, and acknowledge the true living God, and leave the paganism behind, leave the idols behind, leave the false religions behind, and come to worship the true living God, and His Son Yeshua, who died for you, and is raised for you, and is living in you. Hallelujah, hallelujah, hallelujah! That's what the story of Ruth, and really the story of all these five women is really all about. You have a Savior who loves you. You need to acknowledge Him, confess Him, and confess your sins to Him, and say to Him in prayer, Yes, I accept you as my Lord and Savior. I accept you, you, you Yehovah, a God of the universe, as my great God, the living God. That's what we have to come to. Well, it's time to wrap this up, and next time we'll cover in depth some more things you may not have heard about the next two. And you'll know the stories well, but I'm going to bring up some things that I think you'll find very, very interesting. So until next time, this is your brother in Christ, wishing you all peace and shalom and blessings in Messiah. May Yehuah bless you and may his face beam with joy as you live a life pleasing to him and Messiah. May Yehuah guard you and keep you and bring you peace. May his face light up with joy as he thinks of you. So until next time. This is your brother in the faith. 
Philip. Till next time, God be with you all.